Amen. Is that your prayer today? Man, have we ever needed the Lord more than we need Him now? Do you get that? <laughs> oh. Well, the enemy of our soul, the enemy of our soul is working overtime. And uh, I'd been focusing on, uh, we did hell, then we did heaven, and then I talked about the transformation that takes place in our bodies, at the, at the coming of our resurrected bodies, and how God is going to work all of those details out and the incredible promises we have that should have us fixated on how good God is. Because God is good, and all the time, but the enemy hates all that. He doesn't want us thinking about heavenly things. He doesn't want us thinking about the negativity of hell and how bad we want to stay away from there, or the joy of heaven and how much we long to go there, and the incredible promises of the transformation of these bodies into something brand new. Because you know, they're all breaking down. That's the power of sin. And it started after the Garden of Eden, right? Sin entered the world and these bodies started to wear out. They were originally, it looks like in the Garden of Eden, God had prepared for Adam and Eve to live with Him forever there before sin entered in. The real struggle of sin is this understanding that the enemy wants us divided. Did you know we're one body? The Bible says that we as believers are one body. Now, there's a lot of different denominations, there's a lot of different churches, but if we claim Christ, we're just one body. One body, there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's not two bodies and two faiths and two baptisms, there's just one. And I, I've been overwhelmed and I've been thinking about this for months and it, it just seemed like the Lord said, okay Joe, shift gears. And the week before homecoming, I want to talk about not being divided. <laughs> Polarizing opinions, and even when it happens within one household between brothers. We are living in a time that's more divided than ever. And, and the world has always been divided. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if you think back to our nation's history, we were divided in the Civil War, right? And I'm going to mention something about that in a moment. But we, we have been a divided people. And we have a hard time getting our minds together on anything. And division just seems to be the word for humanity. And you think about how easy it is to have a differing opinion than someone else. And, and what is, is really uh, difficult is even within the body of Christ, how you know some folks feel like they're right and everybody else is wrong. And, and if you know Jesus, you know John Wesley said, take my hand. If your heart is as my heart, if your heart is in Christ, uh, we're united. We're, we're one people. But even in the body, there can be division. Now, is that what God intended? Uh, we're to love the Lord our God, with our heart, soul, and mind, and love, let's see, the second one's similar. I gotta, let's see, love, who is it? Um, love who? Your neighbor, and, and you love them like you love them like yourself. Huh. Over in Philippians, we're to have this same mind of Christ, and we're to look at each other as better than ourselves. We're to love each other. We're to support each other. And you know, the Bible even says we're to love our enemies. Matthew 5, right? Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Isn't that hard? I mean, that's like real Christianity. Does God really expect us to really be like that? I mean, really? I've got to love everybody. Larry, I've, I've got to love my enemies and, and my neighbors. What if, what if my, my neighbors, now hang on, what if my neighbors are Muslims? Am I supposed to love them? What if they're from another country and their skin's a different color? Am I supposed to love them? We're not even looking at the Scripture, but we know the Word of God, don't we? We know what's right, don't we? And yet we battle because the enemy wages war against us. And too often we are filled with hate and anger when if we were to represent Jesus Christ in this world, we're to be filled with love and grace. So how are you doing in grace? Are you following after God's Word? Are you following after God's heart? Are you, are you following the model of Scripture? Because I think somewhere along the way, 
we, we came up with the model and we attach it to the Bible, but it's not what the Bible says. I mean, read, read through the Gospels and, and what did Jesus bring to us? Well, we're going to go old school today. We're going to go into the Old Testament. And I'm not going to keep you but two hours. But anyway, I want us to look at, at when brothers get in conflict and what that looks like and how we need to be careful about how we live our lives and about how we honor God. So it's from the book of Genesis chapter 4. We're jumping over the fall, but we're seeing the effects of the fall now. Uh, Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why was your countenance, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Wow. Wow, lots going on in that text. It's interesting going back to Genesis. We know that God created all things and that uh, eventually He had created man on the seventh day and He said it was very good. Yeah, isn't that great? I mean, He created animals and the moon. I mean, He created the sun and the moon. He said, that's good. But He created us and He said, that's very good. Can you imagine? And it even says in Genesis that he had stamped his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So if you just wonder about the original uh, specs from the factory, uh, male and female was how we were created in the image of God. In the image of God. In the image of God, we were created. We bear the image of God. Humanity bears the image of God. Humanity. Do you get that? Isn't that mind-boggling? And then we know that, that uh, Satan, uh, he was more cunning than all the other uh, creatures. And he, he, he spoke to Eve and he said, Did God really say if you ate from that tree you would die? And, and so she ate from the tree and then Adam, he just jumped right in. Whatever you say, honey. Connie enjoyed that. She said, Amen. And Junior's like, Help me, Lord. No, I'm just kidding. 
I'm just kidding. But, but Adam jumped right in. There was no quarrel. There was no qualms. There was no disagreement. There was no, honey, you're wrong. No, none of that. Adam jumped right in. And sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's decision. And then God kicked them out of the garden, didn't He? And there was a flaming sword put at the beginning of the garden so Adam and Eve couldn't get back in. And so you would think at this point that this family would hate God. You would think at this point, God has kicked us out of this incredible, perfect garden. God has sent us away. God has shut the door. We can't get back in, and we're going to be done with God. But that isn't what we read in Scripture. Because see, it's it's like a child, and and child psychology teaches this. Even when parents are mean to their kids, the child is, is wired to love the parent. And it starts in the very, very beginning. And so Eve, we're going to look at family worship as the first thought here. And what could have happened is Eve could have said, No, I'm not worshiping God anymore. But when Cain and Abel came together, uh, Cain and Abel, when Adam and Eve came together as husband and wife, they brought forth a child. And Eve said, Praise the Lord. I have had a child because God enabled me. She gave God thanks. She set a model there to say, We're going to reverence God in this household. And you know, she had struggled and she had fallen. She had sinned. It wasn't a mistake. It was a sin, right? (laughs) We like to call everything a mistake. I just made, no, I sinned. (laughs) Just be honest with yourself. God already knows. So, uh, Eve said, I've had a baby. And God, remember what the the curse upon her was? In, In pain, she would bear children. And we don't know how long it took. We don't know what happened. But she said, God is worthy to be praised. So it starts with the parents. And you know what? Parent, grandparent, it's our responsibility. It, 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 ought to, it, it ought not to be a burdensome responsibility, but we're to model knowing the living God to our kids. And they need to know that there's certain rituals in place. And so that's the next thing we see built in rituals apply because what happens is the kids knew that they were supposed to bring God gifts. They knew that there was to be offerings at the beginning of harvest. They bring to God offerings. And so there was this built-in ritual. Now, do we ever read before in the text in in Genesis 1, 2, or 3 that God had commanded you bring me an offering? That God said to me, bring me uh, offerings of the land or bring me offerings of, uh, of animals? And yet Cain said, it's time. It's that time of year again. And so we have this understanding that offerings are made. That there was a ritual in place. It's kind of like raising your kids to know that, that the Bible's really important in your life. And how would they ever know that? Show and tell. I can remember Grandma Harding, Nana. She I had this little green hassock. It was like a little stool. It was round, had a big pad on the top. It was that old vinyl stuff. You know what I'm talking about? The old vinyl stuff. And, and, and she had her Bible open there all the time on it because she'd be reading it. And I went, oh, I grew up with walking into a house and, and there was an open Bible all the time, but it wasn't in a place like in the corner. It was like right in front of her. Oh, okay. I didn't understand all that. But I had that imagery in my mind. I still got it. I see the green hassock right now. Is it a hassock? I don't know where I got that term from, but I like it. But, but there's this understanding that it flows down from us. It's a top-down thing. And listen, you can't make up for the past, but you can sure enter into the present. Hear that. You can't make up for the past, but you can enter into the present. You can't make up for the past. This past is behind us. It's gone. But today's a new day. Today's a new day. And listen, if it's time to to crack open the Bible and start reading it, it's a good day. If it's time to start praying and modeling for our children that we pray, I remember uh, Emily Staley's daughter telling me that the door would be shut. And she said, I can remember hearing my mom call out my name back in the bedroom praying for me. Isn't that, isn't that something we'd hope to, our kids would be able to say, I heard mom pray for me. I heard dad pray for me. Listen, if they're not home and they can't hear, you keep praying anyway. You keep praying anyway. Well, offerings are made. And so we know that they knew that this was right. This was good. That they wanted to continue worshiping God. So somewhere down the line... The kids say, we're going to do like mom and dad, and we're going to make offerings to God. Well, families share traditions with each succeeding generation, but not all traditions carry over. And that's tough, isn't it? And sometimes we forget that we're setting a standard, and 
and uh, our kids follow in our footsteps. Well, the family feud happens, and I'm not talking about Richard Dawson or who else. Uh, who's the guy now? I watch him all the time. Huh? Steve Harvey. Yeah, he's funny. But uh, the family feud, and it's when you pit two families against each other, and yet here's one family, one family, one family, feuding against each other, but there's no cause for a feud. Well, anger may lead to sin. And so the living God speaks to Cain. Isn't it interesting when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had sinned and they were hiding from God that God said, hey, where are y'all? And what did Adam say? We're naked and we're hiding from you. And God says, who said you were naked? Who said that to you? And so here... Uh, it is something different. Cain isn't even hiding from God. Cain is stepping up a notch. He hasn't just committed an act uh, of rebellion, but he has committed murder. And so anger is holding him, and anger is a dangerous place to be. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why was your countenance, and why has your countenance fallen? And then get this, church, if you do well, will you not be accepted? It was very interesting reading about this text because nowhere are we told that Cain had a bad offering. We're not told that. We're just told, it does get very specific about Abel's offering being the firstborn and the fat of them, that, that it, it, we're, we're kind of given a little more information, but we're not told that Cain had a horrible offering. And as I was reading, one of the things I found was that, you know, God doesn't look at the exterior, but God looks at your heart. And you know, God knows where your offerings come from. God knows why you do what you do. God knows the core of your being. He knows who you are. Nothing is hidden from Him. And so, the living God addresses Cain. He says, why are you so upset? All you have to do is what's right. Isn't that the truth today? All we have to do is what's right, what's pleasing to God. And isn't that the tension? The way that leads to life is narrow, but the way that leads to destruction is broad. Do you want to be on the narrow way? Do we need to be on the narrow way to make it home? Yes, because that's what God's Word says to us. And so we see anger rising up in Cain. Why are you angry, God says, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will, and why, here we go, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. Sin lies at your door. And actually the reference here is to an animal getting ready to attack a, a flock. An animal getting ready to come after its prey. This would be like a lion getting ready to pounce on a gazelle because it's been separated from the herd. This is like an animal getting ready to destroy another animal. This sin at the door is that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's waiting for us to fall in alignment with him. And sin may lead to death. Uh, in the Hebrew, there's not as many words as in the English. And so I was reading a commentary, and this uh, scholar gives you their, their rendering, their interpretation, their translation of the Bible. And it just says, it says it like this, Cain and Abel in the field, Cain killed Abel. And yet, the, the, those who translated, they said, well, there had to be a, 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 a process to get, to get them out. What was also very interesting to me is this understanding of what it takes to till the ground. You see, Cain was a gardener, and he knew what it looked like to till the ground. And he had implements or tools that he used to till the ground. He knew what it was to, to plant something in the earth, and that's the Lord calling. I'm, I'm doing okay, Lord. I, I, they got ten minutes. And so... <laughs> But he had tools to break up the hardened soil. And he used one of those tools that he had to plant with to kill his brother. Now, 
Now, do we ever see a conflict between Cain and Abel? Did Abel say, ha, 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 God didn't like your stuff. No, we don't have that, do we? And we don't have Cain saying, well, I don't know why my brother thinks he's better than me. But what did Cain have to do with his anger? Where did Cain place his anger? Was Abel deserving of the anger of Cain? Did did Abel do something to cause Cain to want to kill him? Well, the bottom line is, is that Abel just worshipped God well. And that ought to let you know something. If you worship God well, you might have a problem here on earth, but you will not have a problem in eternity. Do you hear that? You may have a problem here on earth, but you will not have a problem in eternity. Amen. You may have problems. They persecuted me, Jesus said. Guess what? They'll persecute you. If you're not having any of that, maybe you need to step up your game a little bit. The enemy of our soul comes after us. Well, sin may lead to death, and death brings real accountability. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to be keeping up with Abel? And love your, let's see, love your neighbor as yourself. That may mean that we've got to do more than say we love people. We ought to keep up with them. We ought to be connected to them. How will anyone ever know that we love the living God if they never see it borne out in our lives? If they never see our lives? If they don't see us living it out? How do we really model what it is to know the living God? Isn't it how we live our lives? Or is it just some statement that we signed at some point in our life and it's in a filing cabinet? Is it just a legal document? Or is it how I live today? I tell you, Romans 8.1 is a powerful encouragement. But too often we don't read the whole verse. It says, there is now, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's great. Is that the end of the, is that the, end of the verse? Who walk not after the flesh, who walk not, N-O-T, who don't fall after the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Listen, if we want to be free from condemnation, we have to choose to go God's way, and God's way is walking in accordance with His Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to guide us. And so God speaks to Cain again. Isn't it interesting that how God holds us accountable and God speaks? You know, God could have just said, I'm done with that idiot. <laughs> he could have said that about Joe a long time ago. Amen? Amen. He could have just said, nope. You had your shot. And yet, in the midst of Cain's sin, God speaks to him. Hey, what's going on? And he's already told him, listen, Cain, you're about to get in a mess. You need to be really careful right now. You need to hang on. You need to watch what you're doing with your anger. You need to be careful. And then Cain turns right around, and he kills Abel. And again, God says, Cain, what's going on? What's going on? That's powerful. And so we have some real accountability here in our text. Well, sin will tear a family apart and cause great division which destroys lives. And what does Satan want? John 10.10 Jesus says, I've come and to give them life. He says, but the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Whose team are we on? Are we we, we here to build a life? Are we... Are we here to to grow the kingdom? Are we here to kill and steal and destroy? Well, and the family curse. And you know, let me let me let me tell you something. (laughs) Let me let me just tell you something. Uh, Sin has consequences. God forgives sin. God forgives sin. Hallelujah. First John one nine. If I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But sin has consequences. Sin. Listen, if, if I drive 45 miles an hour through a school zone at Concord High School, <laughs> dropping off my son <laughs> for band at 7 in the morning, and I get a ticket, God can forgive me of that, but does it mean that I don't have to pay the ticket? No, I had to pay that stinking ticket. But I said, I know Jesus, they didn't care. I'm a pastor. They really didn't care. 
So there, 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 are, there are consequences to our sins. So don't forget that. You know, God will forgive you, but just know that your actions will bring consequences. And we want to be careful of the consequences and who experiences those consequences. Because so often we think it's just us, but it trickles down. It trickles down. Well, and he said, uh, God says to Cain, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me. Does God know everything? <laughs> the blood of your brother, uh, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. Think about that. Cain was a master gardener and he knew how to plant some seeds and he knew how to get a harvest and God had been blessing his harvest and he was having an, an, an abundance of produce. But now God says this ground that you love to dig up, this ground that you love to plant things in, you planted the wrong thing in there. You planted your brother's blood and it cries out to me. And he says, guess what? This ground isn't going to work for you anymore. So now you are cursed from the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. And so we have uh, the loss of livelihood here. The loss of livelihood. Here, everything that Cain had banked on to take care of him. And listen, he couldn't go to food line and get a can of, of peas when he wanted some to go with his meatloaf. <laughs> mm, I'm getting hungry. It's about time to wrap up. Uh, he had he had a grower. He didn't eat it. And God says, "You're going to struggle." And can I tell you, when you honor God, He's going to honor you. When you give freely to God and your attitude is right with God, He's going to bless you. He's going to do things for you that you're going to have to say, that was a miracle. The world may say, well, it was just good fortune. The world may say, well, you just signed the right form. But we know that God works in miraculous ways and He blesses us beyond our wildest understanding if we'll honor Him. But God will also not honor us if we refuse to obey Him. God will not honor us. So we see a loss of livelihood. And then we see fear of the future. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. That's interesting. I shall be hidden from your face. See, he was more concerned with not being able to garden anymore than he was with not being able to be in God's presence anymore. Isn't that interesting? He was more concerned about not being able to go to work anymore than he was about being in God's presence anymore. But then he says, because his punishment <clears throat> is too great, he says, okay, I can't till the ground. I won't be in your presence anymore, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone finds me will kill me. He said, guess what? Somebody's going to try to kill me now. Well, he never says, oh yeah, I killed my brother. You never see any penance here. You never see him saying, I really blew it. I should have never killed my brother. You never have him saying, I'm sorry for what he's done. And I can tell you folks, the world will never tell you it's sorry for the way it treats you. But when we meet the living God, he'll just say, well done. And it won't matter what the world had to say to us anymore. All that matters is what our Father has to say to us. And so he had this tremendous fear of the future. He was afraid he would die even though he had taken a life. And yet grace exists. Grace exists. Yes, there are consequences, but grace exists. And so in verse 15, And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. God gave Cain a reprieve. He said, I'm not going to annihilate you right now. You're not going to experience physical death. Yes, you killed your brother. He experienced physical death, but you have opportunity. You have opportunity to know me. You have opportunity to serve me. You have opportunity to live for me. I'm not taking your life. Could God have taken his life? Could God have just annihilated Cain from the earth? But did he? No. Grace is extended. Can you fathom that? A murderer was forgiven of murder in the sense that his life was not taken. Well, families bear the burden of consequences caused by sin, and yet in the midst of the curse, God extends grace. 
Family brings the reality of polarizing opinions. Brothers don't always agree. Anger is the wrong response and may lead to sin. Sin destroys families and relationships in general. God holds us accountable for our actions. When we think no one knows or has seen, the living God calls our name. Consequences are real and we all bear the scars that come with them and yet our God offers hope. Even in the hardest heart, His desire is an unbroken relationship with Him that is measured out by our relationships with each other. Are we angry and dejected? Sin is crouching at our door and we must master it before it masters us. Jesus says that even if you say Raka to your brother, you're in danger of hellfire. If you speak ill of your brother, you're in danger of hellfire. We talked about hell one time, didn't we? We all want to go to heaven. Let's live like it. Let's pray together. Father, as we bow before you, we just confess that the enemy works against us and we know that he is powerful, but we know greater is he that is within us than he that is within this world. Lord, we want the world to know you. We want the world to see your light, not buried or hidden under a basket, but proclaimed, shining on a lampstand. Help us to be your light in this world. Help our lives to model you in this world. Help us to bear the name of Christ well. Help us to have the same opinion, the same mindset that was in Christ Jesus. Who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself and became obedient even to death, and that on a cross. Help us to have his heart, Lord the heart of your Son, the very image of God stamped within us that we might model you in this world, that many may come to know you. Many may experience your grace and your forgiveness. And just as we are forgiven, Lord, may many others experience that because we have shared your light in this world. Lord, help us. Help us. And we will be grateful. We want to be yours. Help us to be all yours. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And let all God's kids say together, Amen and Amen. If you're able to stand, please stand with me for a blessing from God's Word. Just another reminder of the incredible goodness of our God and expectations. <laughs> uh, hear this word. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That's all of it. <laughs> that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. According to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go with God. He goes with you. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.